How can we share our faith in an evolutionized world? Is it possible for every Christian to evangelize? The rubber hits the road today on Creation Magazine Live. Well, today we've got uh, a very special guest, my friend Corey McKenna here, and uh, Corey is uh, a radio personality, a professional evangelist, and uh, Corey, welcome to Creation Magazine Live. Thanks for the invite, guys. Appreciate great, it. Great to yeah. have you here. So, we're going to continue uh, this second uh, edition of Creation Magazine Live with, uh, with someone who gets out there and actually shares his faith on a regular basis, and uh, perhaps we're going to go from the theory component as to what we talked about right, last, last program, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. To uh, to the rubber hits the road where, where people are out there actually doing it. So um, I hope I hope there'll be a help. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So well, what, we, what we've been saying on the last program is that society is more like the Greeks. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have that Christian basis. That generations ago, yeah, it was there. But right. Right. we're looking at society now. It's more like the Greeks. Uh, they don't understand Christian terminology. Mm -hmm. How do we evangelize? And right. that's the that's right. really the great. Where we're yeah, going. let's talk about it. Sure. Maybe we'll just fill our, our uh, viewers in here. Who are you? What do you do? How do you do it? And, yeah. and then just sure, I'm the founder of uh, the Cross Current. Uh, the Cross Current is a, a local missions ministry and uh, outreach broadcast. And we would say bringing glory to God's name in Canada, but obviously uh, we we expect to, to help out anywhere. And uh, what we do is we help pastors. Uh, equip all Christians under their care to be his witnesses. Every day we say, everywhere, to everyone, we want to normalize evangelism to make it just right. an everyday extension of your life and witness. And, right. uh, and we do that um, to serve pastors. That's what we do. And we really do three things to make that happen. Number one is we do witnessing and witnessing training. Uh, we do outreach broadcasts as well. And right. we, uh, we have a web-based resource system that sort of undergirds the whole project as well, so that, okay. that's helpful. So you do witnessing yes. that's, that's, uh, yourself, and you teach it, so how do you do witnessing yourself <laughs> and, and your team? Yeah. Well, obviously, uh, witnessing is, is a lot of things. Um, you sort of have your, your personal mission field that I would say would be your family and friends, mm -hmm. uh, which God calls us to care for and to steward that, that immediate co point of contact, but we would also take people out onto the streets and ice break with strangers and, uh, and, and share the gospel. That is our goal, ultimately, to sow the seed of the gospel. You mentioned that on your last program, that we, we sow, we water, God brings the increase. Right. So our ultimate goal is to, uh, is, to, is to sow the seed of the gospel or water that seed. It's all about the gospel. That's the power of God for salvation. So Now you've got a radio program and soon to be TV program right. from what I hear about. Yeah. So how does that work with when you and your teams are out witnessing to people and, and, and what, do you, what do you do with your radio program? Yeah, well what we do with the radio program is we basically would take a, a hot topic in the culture and that would be a, a springboard icebreaker and we would term a bridge builder to find common ground with people, right. just to talk about matters of, of, of faith and, and spirituality, but we would call it the spiritual speaker's corner. Right. And what that gives people is a very safe place to, um, to chat about uh, their hang-ups with Christianity, maybe what's going on in the world. And right. we, we, we are very upfront and honest when we say, well, we have a spiritual component to this. Are you okay with that? Hmm. And they say, sure. People are very open to talk about spiritual things, so hmm. uh, that's sort of the framework, and that's very disarming because we don't we don't come at people as, as a church or a, you know um, we're a radio show, so uh, everyone wants right. to be heard, sure. and uh, <laughs> so if you've seen Speakers Corner, that forum for communication, it's very popular because people can speak their mind. So what's exciting about that for us is that we find that because uh, they don't really know us that well, people will unload on us. What they <laughs> maybe aren't willing to share with family and friends so much, uh, they'll share well, with that's, us that's very great. freely. So Corey, you, you found a way to engage people in one-on-one -on -one conversations with the goal to evangelize. And you, you found a way, you call it icebreakers, right? To, to a hot topic or something like that. Right. So that's, 
And, and what you're Great saying strategy. is, is you're finding it's easy to share your faith. I, I, I think a lot of people, you know, we talked to this, like, it's, it's, it's just intimidating, and that's one yeah. of the reasons we wanted to do these shows is to, to, yeah, to make people sure. comfortable with the yeah. concept of events. So yeah. you're finding that people are open to having these discussions? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we just take a, a sincere interest in people's soul. I mean, what, what greater expression of love mm. to talk about eternity with somebody? Sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we just find that, that if people will, uh, will quit playing that mental movie <coughs> that they've ran in their mind for years and years <laughs> of what they think is going to happen that never will happen, and they can trust in God and just in simple faith. It's not about my ingenuity. It's not about me being a, the smartest guy on the planet. It's just about being faithful and obedient with what he's called me to do. Okay, and that's so what we train people. So you go out and witness personally and you bring a team of people out, right? We do, yeah. Actually, I went out with you one time. Right, I thought yeah. it was great. Yeah. It, was, it was really uh, a neat experience. Eye-opening you know? too. Oh, yeah. definitely, definitely. Yeah. And then you also teach, uh, so you go to churches and you do seminars, you do teaching on evangelism, is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Uh, someone, thankfully what someone did for me is took me by the hand and said, let's be fishers of men, a right. lot like Christ did. And what someone did is, is actually said, well, let's learn it and then live it. Right. Let's talk mm -hmm. about it around tables and work out our problems and then let's go see if it really works like God says it works. I mean, I think the pragmatism of the church is really starting to create a lot of confusion and the ends justify the means. I don't think we have to be that, um, you know, we don't have to be that even creative. I think what we do need to do is be faithful right. and we do need to understand the culture as you guys have already said, absolutely. We need to understand the mission field. And um, so yeah, we find that training at churches just not just uh, around, you know, uh, uh, sort of a lecture style, mm -hmm. but when we take people out, uh, the light bulb goes on and they say, wow, I can really approach someone and talk to them about this stuff. This, right. you know, people are open, people are curious, but the truth is what divides and that's what we're out to share with people is the right. truth. Now, I, I think we should just make one point and then I think uh, you wanted to make a comment about something yeah, Corey had yes, sent yes, you. Yeah. Um, what is the message? I mean, we, we talk about using creation evangelism or, or these, these things we've been discussing on our program to, to break down obstacles that people have for their faith. But right. l let's just make it very clear. If you just had a person open to hearing your message, what is the key thing you want to communicate right. to them? Like, let's get all the fluff out of the way. What is it you're trying to present? Yeah, if you hit our website, we call it the, the got a minute message. And we'll often say to people in jest, hey, if you're standing beside someone's bedside and they're about to die. <laughs> you got a minute. You got a minute. <laughs> okay. What are you going to say? And uh, <laughs> most yeah. people don't have that on their, on their lips. Right. We would say, where, would you spend, where will you spend eternity? The Bible says that the price of sin is death, right. but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So how many times have you sinned? How many times have you lied, lusted, stolen, hated, used God's name in vain? Right. Because every time you have, you've sinned against holy God, alienating yourself from Him. Even right. your thinking is against Him. Right. So you will face the second death, which is eternity in the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. But Jesus Christ paid for our sins. Right. He took... He took them and God's wrath against you upon Himself. Right. He shed His blood, He died on the cross in your place, and then He rose from the grave, defeating sin and death, just as the Scriptures foretold that He would. Right. To be reconciled to God, we must repent, wake up, to trust Jesus died for us, and then, then we'll be born again of the Spirit, not of flesh. Right. Then we can expect God to truly start changing us from the inside out, filling us with His abundant new life, and purpose, and that's good news. Right. And that's what that's. If so, I had 60 you know seconds, that, that was less than 60 minute, seconds. Yeah, <laughs> you can do a gospel presentation. Absolutely, I mean, that's great training. Yeah. Really practical training. Yeah. That, uh, now I'm sure you're getting the next. The follow-up questions are what gets in the way of that. God, and there are a lot of things. <laughs> well, I've I've sure. got an email here that you sent me. You, you said just just before we started here that okay. you don't even remember sending this, right. but uh, <laughs> yeah. the the final sentence that you wrote really stuck with me. You wrote this. Richard, I know for sure that anyone who says that evolution is just a side issue just isn't sharing the gospel, period. Mm. That's a pretty strong statement. What did you mean by that? Well, Can you expand on that? Let me just qualify this, please. <laughs> Email is a pretty one-dimensional means of communication, so you didn't hear me say that. I did say that compassionately. Yeah. <laughs> okay. what, what we're finding basically is that um, if, if you will actually love someone enough to ask them about what we would term your common condition, not inquire about whether they want a happier life or they want more purpose. Um, that's, that is not the common condition. We all have a common condition called mortality. The Bible says that they're in bondage to a fear of that. So if we'll just say to people, hey, what do you think happens when you walk off this planet? And make it, make it a heavy statement, it's a heavy idea, but right. make it in a way that, wow, it, that's a great question. What I was getting at with that is that where we do have spiritual speakers corner, that gives us a chance 
to really intersect with someone on a street corner for a moment in time, and they're very honest with us. And, and you, you said earlier that they, they unload and they tell you what they're really thinking they about. They do, they okay. do. And what I'm getting at is that they tell us, and we're gonna hear some of that, yeah. they tell us exactly what they're thinking and all the things that you guys are talking about, what this ministry's focused on, why we support you guys, right. why, we, why we use your, our, your resources with our evangelists is because you guys are scratching where they itch and you need to be encouraged in that. And you're gonna hear evidence of that as, as we uh, are so time you, unfolds. you're just saying that you are hearing them say well evolution is a huge barrier yeah absolutely yeah and we'll get into the evolutionization I mean they might not say it like that but they have bought into uh, the lie of evolution and they're suppressing the truth that they know to be true right we, we yeah. often get uh, this notion that that creation evolution is a side issue doesn't really relate to anything involving Christian living today right and you're 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 saying yeah, it does. Evangelism. Right. We're going to hear about that, I think, in our next segment. So stay, stay tuned here. We're going to actually hear some live witnessing clips when we come back. When sequences of DNA which did not appear to code for protein were discovered, some evolutionists suggested that these represented junk or vestigial DNA, leftovers of our supposed evolutionary ancestry. However, researchers the world over are confirming that non-coding DNA holds critical clues to a vast range of diseases. A leading figure in genetics, Professor John Mattox said, the failure to recognize the implications of the non-coding DNA will go down as the biggest mistake in the history of molecular biology. For details, go to www.creation.com. If God didn't create the sun until day four, how could each of the previous three days have been real days? Although we are not told what the light source was, the Bible says that God created the earth and light on the first day. Thus, we can deduce that on the first three days, the earth was already rotating in space relative to God's created light, enabling a day-night cycle. In the book of Revelation, we read that in the future new heavens and earth, there will once again be no need for sun. In 1853, archaeologists found a series of 12 tablets dated to around 650 BC, the story of the hero Gilgamesh. The Gilgamesh epic has close parallels to the account of Noah's flood and has led some skeptics to imply that the biblical account is a retelling of the Babylonian legend. However, there are major differences which give clues as to which account is more accurate. In the Gilgamesh epic, the Ark is a cube, a terrible design for rough waters. Noah's Ark was built to be tremendously stable. The Genesis account came first. The Gilgamesh epic is a distortion. Have you ever heard that your appendix is a useless vestigial organ left over from your evolutionary past? At one time, evolutionists believed there were more than 180 functionless structures in the human body, today virtually none. Even up to 2002, some dictionaries define vestigial as relating to a body part that has become small and lost its use because of evolutionary change. Today, the appendix is recognized as a special part of our immune system. In Genesis chapter 2, the order of creation seems to be different to that in chapter 1, with the plants being created after Adam. Does the Bible contradict itself here? A close look at the original language reveals that the plants mentioned in chapter 2 verse 5 refers to cultivated plants only, not all plants. The point being made is that in the world before the curse, before the appearance of thorns and thistles, no one was needed to cultivate plants. Another thing to keep in mind is that Genesis 2 is not a chronological account like chapter 1. It focuses mostly on the details of day 6. When the Bible appears to contradict itself, careful study always reveals that the Bible is free of contradiction. It really is the Word of God.
Corey, you've got an audio clip here for us from, uh, this was from, what, a, a gay pride festival uh, from last year? Yeah, in London last year. Last uh, can summer. you set that up for us a little bit? Sure. Um, boy, we had the privilege of, of speaking with Eric. Uh, Eric is a homosexual man. He's been at, uh, I think, might have been his first gay pride. And um, just to sort of set it up, we like to offer disclaimers as we play audio and video. Number one is that um, we're so thankful that people take the time to talk. Right. And it's, we want to be very clear that our goal is not to expose people or embarrass people. It's right. really just we're all pursuing truth. We believe we've found it and we want to hear what they think about it. Right. So that's the first thing. Number two is that um, because we're outside, because it's, we call it reality TV or radio or whatever, right. there's baggage with that. We're on their property, their terms, and, uh, and sometimes there's ambient noise, sometimes there's pops and, and, uh, and music and things like that. So I, I think in both these clips you're going to hear that. But what's important to know as we set this up First of all, is I'd already shared the full gospel with Eric. Okay, we okay. did that at the front end. You've already done that yep. at the point. Already done that. Listen. Yeah, he's heard he's heard the First Corinthians fifteen one to eleven gospel very clear. <laughs> and uh, and what I want the viewers to, to listen to here is um, is usually when we're talking with someone, our, our little slogan of the ministry is "Got questions, get answers." Right. So we give people a safe place to ask questions about what they've heard. Well, usually the first response or the first question that people will will ask is a, we call it a surface question. They're, they're just sort of regurgitating something someone else has said to them. Right. They haven't thought about it, it just seems like a pat answer. Right. And, um, but if we'll probe a little deeper, we'll get to the heart of, 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 the, of the person asking and the heart of the issue, out of the overflow of the heart the mouth speaks. Okay. So uh, we find that the truth comes out. This is what they really <laughs> want to know the answer right. to. There's an answer and then there's the real reason. Exactly, <laughs> so what I want people to hear is that, uh, is that Eric gives sort of a few pat answers about the Bible and can it be trusted, which are real concerns. Those are good questions, but they're not new questions, obviously. Um, but what I want you to hear is that he really grabs a hold of this evolutionary idea and his worldview, not only does it sort of justify his homosexuality, but it really helps him sort of to angle Christians as bigoted and biased and just out to sort of to persecute that community. So. That's how I'd set it up, and uh, I think you'll find it um, very interesting. Good. Well, yeah. let's listen to it now. Sure. But you guys have been great. And will you guys think about our conversation a little bit? You've been cool to chat with. Any any questions we can bring back for our radio show? Yeah, you go ahead. Um, um, down. Like, as far as the Bible goes, all yeah. the stories, and it's, did Jesus walk on water? Did Jesus cure people, touch them, or anything like that? For you to say, like, how do you believe that, as opposed to it not being relevant or right. making sense in today's world. I think it's Absolutely. just like a fantasy kind of like, yeah. your stories, your mythological stories, I think you should take that as it is and yeah. not add too much into it, I guess. Great question. And I think a big thing is that if you look at the Bible itself, what is it? It's a book whereby God, it's his story, you might say. God starts off revealing more and more of himself throughout human history. So the thing is, is if, if you don't believe the beginning as it is, like, i.e., first of all, God created, I believe God did create. I, I believe that God did speak the thing into existence. I think we have lots of evidence that would say there is a God. Complexity and the design. You know, you look at the fact that just in one cell of your body, there's somewhere between two and three Encyclopedia Britannicas. Just in one cell, you have machinery head to toe. Not only that, but within that machinery, there's a language system that codes to build you as, you know, you have dark hair, you have dark eyes. You know, so we know that the language system could not have evolved. We know that language system has has to have an intelligent source, just like Morse code, just like anything. Like, I think there's something bigger out there, but I, mean, I just can't personally can't follow anything which tries to tell me exactly like it is. Right, you know? right. I can, I can know that we're intelligently designed and right. there might be something there, but sure. as far as being at gay pride, like, do you think homosexuality is a sin and am I going to hell because of that? What is the Christian stance on that and why are homosexuals not allowed the same rights as straight people? Right. If, if sexuality is a biological function, not a, right. not a choice. Yeah, yes. right. For instance, it's been proven that over, over thousands of species by sexual violence. It's not just human beings. Okay, that's good. Right. You know what I mean? But, and that would, would be in line with evolution, right? Yeah, evolution. Okay. And spirit, like, males are... They want to, they're the reproducers of, of, of society, right? And, yeah. and of, of nature itself, species. But now, I would love for you to email me the scientific 
papers that say biologically, biologically, not 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 emotionally, sociologically, is there? A, and if there is, please correct me. I've never seen. I think correct. Please, can you send it to me? I can show you. Please, take my card. Take that. Can you, can you seriously email me? I'd love to hear. And I'm not being facetious, dude. If you could send me, because I've never, and I've done a lot of biological research. I agree wholeheartedly that we are all born in a spiritual condition. I have messed up ideas. Everyone does. You have messed up ideas beyond this subject. We all do. If that's the case, is it possible that, that we do have choices to make? And is it possible that God can change the world? Well, I, mean, I, I find it really hard trying to get me to this information. But yeah, you don't, you don't do the evolution, right. which is based on scientific facts. So you can't ask me to prove sexuality with information when you reject evolution, which is scientists. So you really can't do that. What do you mean? First of all, I can show you what I am myself yeah. and what my sister is. She's yeah. a lesbian too. Yeah. And so, Eric, first of all, evolution, real quick. What do you mean by that? Define well, that for me. As far as the Bible, biologically evolution. No, get out the Bible. Out. Biologically, uh, what is evolution? She's evolved from, uh, you know, another form instead of and dinosaurs and whatnot. I don't, I don't really know what the Bible goes as far as that, but I, if it's the Bible just leaves all that out, I mean, and there's bones and scientific evidence to prove, you know, that just as much as there is to prove that Jesus was alive and artifacts. Yep. Here's a big difference: is people were there to see Jesus walk. Josephus tacking his flag on. So in terms of evolution, let's just let's say you and I go out to the field, we find a fossil. Were you there or was I there or was anyone there to see how that got there? No. So what you do is the same thing I do. So you're saying, say, say so you're the evolutionist and we're in court and I'm, I'm the, you're the prosecutor, I'm the defense guy, however you want to play it. I don't think the burden of proof is on me either necessarily because I think you have the same problem. Let me explain. We're in court and uh, you're saying, see this? And you know in court you've got to enter all the evidence. Yeah. It's illegal to hold back evidence. So we have all the same evidence. You go, oh, dude, clearly, clearly that's a, that's a Neanderthal. And I'm going, wait a sec, no, 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 that looks like a, and so what we do is we have a mental movie, a faith-based position, that we argue that point. Now, we can use observational science to try to bolster our, our side, but do you understand that, that that position that you hold, Eric, just like I hold, it's a faith position because none of us are there to see it. Do you agree? Okay. So back to your question, though, with the evolution thing, it's not really fair or reasonable to say that because you're an evolutionist and I'm a creationist that you're scientific and I'm religious. I would say we're both both religious, we both have a faith, and we use science to try to understand our faith. Okay, but how can you how can you reject like a T Rex bone? But exactly, I, don't. I think that really happened. Oh, okay. So like, how does the Bible explain that? As far as well, the Bible. How can you believe the Bible when they lie? Like not lie, but they their story's a little bit different from the way it actually is. So what's a T Rex? That is called a Transverse Rex. Which is called a dinosaur. Dinosaur. First thing I'd say is that the word dinosaur, Dr. Richard Owen, 1841, he developed. The word dinosaur means terrible lizard. The first version of the Bible is 1611. It predates the word dinosaur, so you won't find that word in there. You won't find email in there. You won't find DNA in there. But you will find a term that is chillingly descriptive of what we would term a dinosaur. Dragon would be one. Behemoth would be one. Leviathan would definitely be one. Job 40. All through the, the KJV version, you see this word dragon. Now, why is that? Because I believe that Job really did see the, the thing's yeah. tails like a cedar tree. Yeah. It's got armor on. So that will be chilling like a, a, what I would term a dinosaur. Yeah. That's sort of the first point. But are you aware of, of some very interesting things? Number one, why did they find cave drawings in, say, Montana recently of Indians? With what is definitely a, a Brachiosaurus alongside Indians. Why did they find that? Why are there so many dragon legends? Why are there so many flags in England and bef that, that have a dragon on them? Why did they find, well, four years ago, a T Rex bone? I can say this article, dude. I'll, I'll send it to you email. A T Rex bone with red blood cells still squishy in it. For real. I this isn't my this is, The thing is, as I'll far as you, the, the, the distinction between dinosaur and lizard or dragon is the carbon dating of the bones. Like 250 million years ago, there weren't humans. There's no human remains. Therefore, dinosaurs existed before humans. And now, are you aware really that changed. carbon dating does not give you a million year figure? You know? I'm not aware, actually. I really don't know anything about that. What you got to know, Eric, is that when, when scientists say evolution happened, just like I say creation happened, they go to the evidence, and I go to the evidence, and what they do is they want that evidence to be a certain age, so do I. 
So what you don't know is 90% of all those dating methods, and there's hundreds, they give an age of less than a billion years for the Earth. It, you see, the thing is, is we build a lot of assumptions yeah. on all this stuff that, that are, are, if you will, it's a faith-based assumption. Yeah. So well, I'm, I'm guilty. I try to yeah. bolster my side just like you would, yeah. but the difference is, is that when you look at the fact that if God really did create, then God clearly says that he created the world. We screwed up. We sinned. Because of sin, the world's been corrupted. We need a way that we can be we can be rich back to God in right relationship. The only way through that is through the cross. God promised Jesus would come. He died. He rose again. So that whole historical narrative, if you will, I believe to be true. And because it's true, then the message I shared at the beginning is true too. Wow. There was a lot of <laughs> a lot of great points in there yeah. that uh, Eric made, and he did. He really did. Great points. I want to I want to acknowledge that and respect that. That right. you know what he made some great points. They great. were untrue, but they were great points. Well, let's take a break and we'll come back and we'll discuss that uh, what we heard. Right. Creation: The Key to Dynamic Witnessing by Dr. Carl Wieland. This presentation was given live to some 2,000 people, many of them students, at South Africa's renowned university town of Stellenbosch. Afterwards, 30 university students came forward in public, going on to profess first-time faith in Christ. It's clear that in this age of science and technology, we need to deal with the evolution issue head-on from an unashamedly biblical standpoint. If we evolved from apes, why are there still apes today? This common creationist argument misrepresents what evolutionists believe. They don't believe that we descended from apes, but that apes and humans share a common ancestor. When defending our faith, it's important for Christians to clearly understand the arguments we try to refute. A better argument can be made by pointing out that the theory of human evolution requires transitional forms, but not one has stood the test of honest, rigorous investigation. All are best understood to be from either an extinct ape or an extinct human. In an effort to imply that biblical writers were primitive, many people have said that the Bible teaches that the earth is flat. Even though the round shape of our planet was an obvious conclusion when watching ships disappear over the horizon and by observing eclipse shadows, what does the Bible say? The implication of a round earth is seen in the New Testament where Jesus described his return. In Luke 17, 31, Jesus said, in that day, then in verse 34, in that night, this is an allusion to light on one side of the globe and darkness on the other simultaneously. In the Old Testament, we read in Isaiah 40, 22, it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. Inspired by their creator, the earth shape was well known to biblical writers. The central teaching of Christianity is directly connected to Genesis. With the first man, Adam, came the first sin, seen in Genesis as violation of the law of God. The Bible teaches that God forgives sin, but only by a substitutionary sacrifice. God has provided salvation through His Son, the last Adam, Jesus Christ. The prophet Isaiah refers to Jesus as the kinsman redeemer, that is, one who is related by blood to those He redeems. All of us, including Jesus, are descendants of the first Adam. An historical first and last Adam are essential to the gospel message. Well, Corey, that was amazing. Uh, just uh, an amazing audio clip. You're at a you're at a gay pride festival, and yep. you end up talking about the gospel and and someone rejecting the Bible or the, its accuracy because of fossils and dinosaurs. You know, How do you get to there uh, from amazing. here? Amazing. Yeah. yeah, and, 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 yeah. And so, yeah. what do you see in that conversation as as the highlights of the flow of that conversation, the main points? Yeah, it's interesting how you know if if that's the first time you hear such a conversation, you go, "That is amazing. Right. That's very typical." And here's okay. what I mean by that: is sort of the common thread that we would see is that if we can talk to someone, if you will, long enough, right, and open enough, 
it's inevitable that those types of concerns, objections, you know, when issues. When you say will, those types, what what do you mean? Those types. Concerns that would be rooted in Genesis 1 to 11. I mean, if you trace back his, the, the, the sort of the, the crux of his concern, right. it all had, he took issue with the history of the Bible. That was the problem. Right. And as did, you said yeah. in your previous program, that the, the second Adam can't, I mean, there, in order for there to be a second Adam, there must be a first Adam. Right. Genesis 3.15 is the first gospel, so way back there. So, so he believes in uh, evolution, so therefore um, his um, Sexual tendencies, that, that's a genetic, uh, you know, that's predetermined by, by genetics. Right. Uh, the Bible can't be trusted because, well, the Bible doesn't talk about dinosaurs. Right. That's right. Yeah. Um, yep. so, so you're saying this is a common conversation? Very common. I mean, we start off, uh, if we can, you know, we sort of liken apologetics to a fight on an airplane. <laughs> and uh, if, you know, I use that, that one minute gospel and it sounded really sharp. And yes, that is, I've memorized that. If right. they can respond, it's not that. I'm not that bright, really. <laughs> but, but what we've found is it's sort of like a fight on an airplane. If I'm on a hopper fight on an airplane, yeah. and I've got someone sitting beside me yeah. that, uh, that is not a Christian, and I've got a very short window of time, right. instead of debating the, the existence of the plane's creator, what I'll do is I'll hang him out the door of eternity without a parachute and say, how does that look? Because that's <laughs> the big picture. If it's a short, but if it's a long flight, then you know what I'll do? I'll do both. I will hang him out the door of eternity without a parachute, but I'll also, it's a powerful thing to be able to, the, I, we believe apologetics is like bait on the hook of God's word. Right. We can use apologetics to unlock the conscience. Right. And the conscience, how do we get to the conscience? By God's law. On their heart is a knowledge. Con means with, science means knowledge. They right. know, they're with knowledge, that violating God's law is wrong. Right. So we'll combine those two things, the conscience, and obviously creation, because Romans 1 and 2 are emphatic that, that those are the ways that truth has been revealed to people. So, right. yeah, so we'll, on the long haul, absolutely, let's, let's hang them out and let's talk about the plane's creator and, the, and, and what's, what's key about that, the plane's creator has also appointed a time that you will jump or this plane will crash. <laughs> so as you, as you make, as you crystallize the identity of that creator, right. they start to go, whoa, and I'm on his airplane, that's correct. Right. And uh, that doesn't happen necessarily overnight, but the good news is from that, uh, from that interview, uh, I, I, you heard me challenging, email me, email me. Well, you know what? We have yeah. been in touch over email. That's great. Uh, we have an army of electronic evangelists. We call them e-reps. Right. And uh, what they do is they follow up with people on the internet and we try to recontact and get those folks to churches because we're not just called to make converts, but disciples. Right. So uh, Eric's been in touch with us. So, so we're very thankful for that. So we, there were some pretty detailed arguments you were, you were using there, but apparently um, challenging his worldview, uh, using those arguments didn't offend him. I didn't really hear him sound offended. You, you didn't sound like you guys weren't, you know, having a fight. You were yeah, just you weren't overly defensive and, and, uh, and, and argumentative. Right. right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you had arguments, but you weren't arguing with him. Right. right. And so he's, he's in contact with you now? He is. And it's interesting. If you look at, at 1 Peter 3.15, apologetics, I believe, is to strengthen the believer and to shame the unbeliever. Right. So what we try to do is we try to take this issue and put it in between us and talk about the issue, not the person. And uh, obviously mm. when we use the law, we are all guilty under the law. The Bible says in Romans uh, 3, verse 19 and 20, that the law leaves the whole world guilty. Right. So we can find common ground in the law. We uh, can find common ground in dinosaurs. We I, can, and you notice that we didn't argue with that. sexuality. You you know, several that? times you said, you said we're all guilty and you included yourself. Yeah. I noticed that several right. times. You included yourself in that as well. Because all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. But we just need to help them understand what sin is, who God is, God, they need to know God exists. I believe that they know that, but that has been suppressed. And sometimes sure. the unbelief in the culture has really given them cloudy vision as to the truth of, of God and, and certainly the scriptures. Right. Have you ever had um, people come out with you and your teams that like didn't have an apologetic base? How are they finding it? Or what's your experience with the teams that you w w bring out? Yeah, what I think is that, um, that a lot of people, like you said in your, your, uh, your last episode, is that they, they say, you know what? It's the power of God's word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing right. by the word of God. Absolutely, we would never question yeah. that. However, because it is more of a Greek culture, what we, we, we're so serious about apologetics now, we've actually just started what we call Paul's three worlds training. So what we've done now is we've, uh, we've looked at, number one, the scriptures. We do heavy training in the scriptures, right. knowing your word, studying the word, applying the word. Right. Go to the word. It's all about the word, right. by his spirit. But we also do uh, training in apologetics and philosophy. 
Paul's the man of three worlds. He was the Hebrew of Hebrews, <laughs> right? You yep. know, Paul knew the scriptures. Yeah. He was, he was able to reason with the Epicurean and Stoics, right. who were evolutionists of that time, basically, what they believed, their, their, their view of truth. And he was a Roman citizen. So through, uh, through scriptural training, mm -hmm. through uh, uh, philosophical and apologetic training, and citizenship training. Mm -hmm. So what would you might say? If apologetics is, is bait on the hook of God's word, then we, what we'll do is we'll shine up uh, the bait, yeah. right? And, or I should say we'll sharpen up the hook through the scriptural training, we'll shine up the bait, through the apologetic and, and uh, philosophical training, yeah. and we'll uh, and we'll know which shorelines we're able to fish off of, <laughs> and, and knowing us uh, as Canadian citizens or whatever country uh, you're with. Yeah. Right. Right. Now, some of these things you use to uh, to to rebut them yeah. sounded a little familiar. I bet they did. <laughs> yeah, like half your library at CMI. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, we teach our people to to study those things, and um, you know, I, we find very quickly. If you're going to take an, uh, it's a huge undertaking. It's overwhelming. Very quickly, start with biology, start, then go to geology, and then go to astronomy, because that's the rate of, of that we have accessibility to that information. Most people would argue biology first. You heard that they would argue evolution is true. Yeah. We know that because of the changes in living things. Because da, da, da. it's common knowledge. Right. Okay. Geology so you, is a little you've more seen specialized. Seen those patterns even in Absolutely. your discussions. Yeah. Oh, wow. So we would yes. teach that if you're going to specialize in one area. Make it biology, move to geology, astronomy. No one understands that anyway. Wow. So. We're going to see another <laughs> video clip when we come back. It's going to be great. When Dr. Carl Whelan started Creation Magazine in his home in 1978, little did he realize that today it would reach into some 170 countries all around the world and have such a huge impact in so many lives. This unique 56-page, full-color family magazine refutes evolution and gives God the glory for the amazing creation we see around us. Creation Magazine is an essential tool for anyone wanting to immunize their family against the anti-biblical worldviews bombarding us from all sides. With no paid advertising, every page in Creation Magazine is chock full of powerful articles, ammunition to intelligently discuss nature, history, science, the Bible, and related subjects. Although written for laypeople, every effort is made to ensure the content is technically accurate so that even experts are satisfied. And young children look forward to the section written especially for them. Many have come to faith in Christ because of subscribers sharing this magazine with them. So subscribing not only boosts your faith, it enables you to get biblical truth into your community in a special way. Subscribe today and have it delivered to your home every three months. Visit creation.com for subscription information or call the CMI office nearest you. Refuting evolution is a hard-hitting, point-by-point refutation of today's arguments for evolution. Written especially for students from high school to university, it's one of the most powerful summaries of the arguments against evolution and for creation. Author Dr. Jonathan Sarfati, a PhD chemist with Creation Ministries International Australia, systematically unravels evolutionary claims in the key areas of the debate. He starts by showing the starting biases held by both creationists and evolutionists, and how it guides their interpretation of the facts they examine. From there he moves on to cover topics like variation and natural selection, missing links, ape men, the Big Bang, the age of the earth, and more. Dr. Sarfati swiftly debunks many of the grand claims made by modern evolutionary theory while simultaneously showing that scientific models proposed by biblical creationists provide a better explanation of the world around us. One of the most popular creationist books of all time, this top-selling book will help stimulate much discussion among students, teachers, and anyone interested in understanding the science behind the origins debate. Where do cavemen fit into biblical history? Based on their evolutionary beliefs, most cavemen were primitive brutes on the way to becoming fully human. From the viewpoint of biblical history, after the confusion of languages at the Tower of Babel as people spread out, they would have lived in a variety of homes made of mud, stone, wood, tents, or in caves. 
The Bible describes a number of cavemen. In Genesis, we find that Lot was once a caveman after he fled Sodom. When David ran from King Saul, he lived in a cave, and Job mentions people who lived in caves also. Thus, you would expect evidence all over the world that skillful, talented, and fully human people have lived in caves at various times. Okay, we're back, and now you've got a video clip for us to, to play for everyone. Yep. And just set it up for us. Who, who's speaking, why did you do it, who are you speaking to? Yeah, we were invited to, uh, to University of Western Ontario okay. and uh, the Christian ministry on site there. And uh, basically it's a, a video interview with uh, a rep of ours named Chris. Okay. He's talking to Nick and Amy who, um, who were raised Christian. Right. One, I think, uh, says went to a Christian high school. Uh, this is a part of a clip, so uh, we've already asked them if they shared the gospel regularly. They don't. Okay. And uh, again, just want to say thanks to them for uh, allowing us to talk to them. And right. the context really is for, for our purposes here today and for us to get a handle on, uh, on how Christians approach truth okay. and, uh, and just sharing the gospel. So they admitted that they don't share the gospel they on did. a frequent yeah, basis? We and, and what was the reason that they say? Uh, basically, just, you know, the typical reasons. They're scared, not a priority, just okay. standard things. So these are Christians then you're these interviewing? These are Christians. Okay, different Christians. than the last one. So. Christians from Christian upbringing. Okay, let's take a look. What type of objections do you guys encounter from your family or friends when you share your faith with them? Or well, have you guys got to that point where you've, you know, what kind of objections do you guys just see in general? Um, I think for me, like my family and friends are mostly mainly Christian, so I don't really think I have many objections through them. I think, I think maybe through non-Christians, it's just, it's just maybe sort of a disbelief kind of thing that you know you can have this relationship with somebody that it's based based on faith alone. You know, like you can't see them every day like you can your other friends and family. So I think it's just you know, just trust. You know? Amy. Uh, pretty much what I've seen through my experience is just that sometimes us Christians are seen as almost that we think we're better than each other. Um, like I went to a Christian high school and it was pretty much casted out as the like most stuck up high school in my town. So that's kind of the objections I see and just like people that aren't Christians just think it's kind of unbelievable and it's a way of just our, to have security I guess in life. And uh, do you guys believe everything you read in the Bible? Is everything in the Bible true? I believe so. You know, I mean, some stories are incredible, and you're like, you know, how could that happen today? And, you know, God has, has a has a great way of showing His love and, and showing, you know, uh, you know that He exists and that He's there. And, and I think, you know, it's it's hard to believe that some of those things would happen today. But but I, I you know, I believe that everything in the Bible is true. You know, it's His words. So. Excellent. Amy? Um, I think the Bible can seem contradictory, um, even the New Testament and the Old, but we have to understand that we're never going to, our human mind is never going to really comprehend the Bible in its full form, but we can try our best to, to, to read it and to understand it. But I think it is all truth. It is all God's Word. We just don't always comprehend it in the right way. And uh, do you believe that science has disproved certain things in the Bible? I think a funny thing about science is uh, is that I think I think it does work with religion sometimes. Uh, I was watching um, I was watching one of these one Christian speaker talking about uh, some some uh, cell in the body that holds you know your skin together and stuff, and it's in the form of a cross. I think that I think that sometimes religion and science do work together. I think that maybe it's a stereotype that they work against each other, but I think that you know they can work together. Amy? Uh, I think I believe the same thing. Like, a lot of the times we go to science to contradict our faith, but really they can work together if we really look into it. I know I had a lecture on how evolution and the Bible can actually intertwine if you look at it in different perspectives. So I think people hold to science um, as a safety because it's always the same thing and it's, we, like, it's there to be seen. But I think if you can intertwine the two. Laminin. Laminin is the cell that holds, that's in the form of a cross. So. Excellent. 
<laughs> and um, do you believe that the book of Genesis is real history? I believe so. You know, as a Christian, I guess, uh, you know, you believe that it is true. So I guess, you know, it's the beginning of time for us, right? So Okay. Amy? Um, I think it is. Um, I... Yeah, it's, it's hard to picture it, I guess, because we, I don't know, it's hard to imagine that it happened where we are right now, but I think it, I think it did happen. Do you think it actually even matters whether or not it's true history or not? I, I don't know. Uh, um, it's a tough question. That's a tough <laughs> question. Uh, Gotta keep you on your toes, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it depends on what you believe, right? It really, uh, I don't know. So, cool. uh, Amy? Um, I think in the end it doesn't matter. Um, there's a reason why it's in the Bible, and maybe it's a metaphor for something, or perhaps it right. didn't actually happen. In the end, I don't know. We're never going to truly know, but... Okay, cool. And uh, what about evolution? Do you guys believe in evolution? No. No. That's okay, sorry about you, uh, I don't think I have studied it enough to really appreciate it or understand or really give an exact answer of yes or no. Okay. Uh, do, you, do you guys think that God could have used evolution? Sure. Sure he could have. Uh, you know, God has a funny way of doing some things sometimes. So I think, yeah, I think, you know, evolution could be, like I said before, science and religion work together sometimes. And it's possible, I suppose. But Okay. Know. Amy. Um, I think he definitely, it could definitely, I think the Bible could prove evolution or it could prove against it. Like even one day in the Bible doesn't mean 24 hours in our terms. We're kind of, that's kind of a human concept. So maybe one day was like a thousand years, which could intertwine with evolution. So. Okay. Um, how do you guys believe that death entered the world? Uh, I guess maybe through... Uh, I mean, I think God intended for everybody to eventually die, right? So I think maybe from the beginning of time, you know, I think that he created Earth for a purpose, and that was to kind of spread his goodness around. And I think that, you know, death has always been around, and it always will be, obviously. So I think it's just, uh, you know, his way of, of giving this life some purpose. So. Okay. Amy? Uh, I think we're all here for a purpose, and pretty much we're not meant to be here for eternity. And I think sin really did bring death into to our world, but yeah, it's more, death isn't always a bad thing. Okay. So, so. Cool. And um, how do you guys think dinosaurs actually fit into the Bible? Or do they fit into the Bible? That's always something that I've actually wondered about, to be honest. Uh, I really don't have an answer for you, but, uh, you know, if somebody's got one, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Amy. I really have no idea. I <laughs> I really couldn't even answer that. Well, we'll talk later about that one. And uh, how old do you guys think that dinosaur fossils really are? Yeah, same sort of thing. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. I'm stumping them. Sorry, man. I don't know if they're as old as everybody thinks they are. I don't know. Yeah. Cool. Well, Amy, anything to add? I think they're pretty old, but I couldn't... Thousands, perhaps. I don't know. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I appreciate it, guys. Okay, well, that was a very interesting yeah. video clip. So you yeah. could see there, so we've got uh, a couple of young people that have grown up in the, in the church. Uh, one has gone to a Christian school mm -hmm. and uh, asked the, the question, well, there's dinosaurs again. I interesting how they had no answer for dinosaurs. Right. And, of course, uh, you, the, the clip before, I don't know if you did this on purpose, of course, but, but the first fellow at the Gay Pride, the, the, you know, he brought up dinosaurs. Well, He's never got an answer, and obviously, right. if you don't have an answer, like like these two people, you wouldn't be able to overcome that stumbling block yeah, that absolutely. he that was so prominent in his mind. Absolutely, I think what we see uh, as we just talk to lots and lots of people, uh, some identifying themselves as Christians, that's getting a smaller and smaller that percentage, especially in a certain demographic. Right. Um, we see a couple things. Number one is is we have to question as equippers of Christians, we're to be disciples and mm -hmm. disciple makers. Are we doing that well? Right. As we look across yeah, the landscape yeah. of Canada, is that happening well? And number two, we see a strong connection that if people do not have answers to questions, they don't witness. That's painful. 
I mean, it, you can only get sucker punched so many times, and you just say, this isn't cool anymore. Right, it, so, it's, it's not a pleasant experience. Yeah, if, if yeah somebody... Nick and Amy were so uh, honest with us that they said, no, we don't, um, we don't, we don't witness on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And those questions, I mean, those are the questions I grew up with. I didn't, I didn't evangelize, but I didn't have answers to them. I was extremely introverted. Um, it just, it, it, it's amazing the level of biblical, not just about creation, but biblical illiteracy. Right comes through in that conversation, but uh, again, not, not to put them down, no. because they represent, as, as you've already said, probably the majority of Christians today. For right. sure. They wouldn't be unusual. And I relate to the, to the skeptic when people would try to talk to me about God or religion or anything like that. I was the skeptic asking, well, what about dinosaurs? Did you get right. them on the ark? Yeah. Did right. some guy get two of every animal on a big boat? These, these questions you know, from the books of Moses that I had. Good so, questions. Again, not new questions, but good questions. Right, yes. right. And they're not new, so the church should have a response. Absolutely. And uh, we'll be back in just a moment. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Most evolutionists believe that two non-chickens mated and the DNA in their new zygote contained the mutations that produced the first true chicken. Unfortunately for evolutionists, the science of genetics does not support their claim. Geneticist Dr. Lee Spetner wrote, not even one mutation has been observed that adds even a little information to the genome. According to the Bible, chickens came first. God created a functionally complete universe. Adam and Eve were created as mature humans, complete with the ability to communicate with God and each other. Belief in evolution has prompted a search for missing links to bolster the idea that man has evolved from ape-like creatures. This has led to some colossal scientific errors, one of which was Nebraska man. Evidence found in 1922 was proclaimed to belong to the first man-like ape of America. The Illustrated London News printed a picture of the ape man, showing the shape of his body, head, nose, ears, the amount of hair he had, his wife, domestic animals and tools. And what was the evidence for the illustration? A single tooth. And not just any tooth, but the tooth of a pig. Jesus, the Creator. Jesus Christ, who walked the earth 2,000 years ago, is also the Creator of the universe. Colossians 1.16 says, For by Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by Him and for Him. Also in John 1.3 we read, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus Christ is the Creator God. Not only does Scripture confirm it, but during his earthly ministry, Jesus did things only the Creator God could do. Wow, that was a really interesting video clip and a, a couple of things came to mind as I watched it. Uh, uh, two passages of scripture, really. Uh, one was, you know, my, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Right. And, uh, and the other one was the greatest commandment, which is love the Lord your God with all your heart, your strength, your soul, and your mind. Your mind. You know, and, and really, um, you know, as I mentioned, here, here, here are Christians, they, they, they love God, and, and yet they're unable to defend the the faith, um, yep. which and you can you can hear in their voices. Well, I'm not too sure about this. Not too sure about that. Uh, even even basic concepts like where death comes from and where well, isn't isn't that the, the the key too? The, these are not complex issues. Did God use evolution? And and it, those should right. be, those should be basic basic questions. Evolution being so prevalent in, in society, every Christian should should know the answer to that. Absolutely. And dinosaurs Absolutely. so popular with right. with kids. Yeah. Christians got to have an answer for how those things fit into the Bible. Yeah. And you look those at the are death basic issue, guys. questions. 
the death issue. issue. It's it's huge. A, I mean, it's an enemy. Yep. The Bible says, but also it says in I believe it's First Timothy, it says Jesus Christ abolished death right. by bringing life and immortality to light through the gospel. Yeah. Mm. If God is responsible for death, how are you going to get to the fact that He fixed death in the gospel? Yeah. Right. Uh, we've, it, just, we've it doesn't make sense. Talked about that so many times on the on the earlier shows. You know how death and sin is integral to the death. millions of years right. and, and all these types of things, but. Um, but anyway, I know your your ministry, the co Cross Current, is yep. committed to not only sharing the gospel, but of course equipping pastors, and uh, and you do um, many workshops in churches. Yeah, we do. Our primary ministry, we would say, is to pastors and churches. We're right. a ministry to the local church. We call ourselves a local missions ministry, but it's to the local churches. We uh, I've pastored myself for a number of years, right. and I know that they're spinning plates and. And uh, I needed somebody to take me by the hand and show me evangelism. We seem to have a program for every other ministry in the church. Uh, <laughs> right. I needed someone to say, let's go walk together and see how this works. Yeah, and that's right. what we do. We take them by the hand, we teach them, we train them, but then we, we go out and they see God's Word, the power of God's Word by Spirit in action. It's pretty, pretty cool. And it's, it's a church building ministry. I think that's, the, that's, our, that's our way out of this mess. You know, we need to build the church. The church is the bride of Christ, yes. the Bible says. Yes. Uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, and, and perhaps historically in the creation movement, we've been, oh, the church has done this wrong and the church right. has done this wrong. At CMI, anyways, I think mm. uh, the, the mindset of us uh, over, over the last number of years has changed. Yes. We're a church building ministry. Right. We want to, in Canada, That's we right. want to reach every church in Canada. Yep. yep. And uh, we want to build the church. Your ministry is focused on building the church, equipping Christians right. yes. to, to, to reverse some of the effects of what we just saw in, in, in right. that couple. He referred to you know plate spinning. So what you're talking about there is the fact that pastors are busy. I mean, my, my, busy. my yep. uh, senior pastor at yeah. my, my local church loved the guy, you know, just loves God. Yes. He's out there, he's with his people, he's shepherding. But let's face it, creation evolution or, or these types of issues, he, you know, he's trying to put a sermon together for yes. the weekend to, to, to feed his, his, his flock. He's got a lot of things to do. And don't you so. just love a pastor that is sold out, wholeheartedly committed to stewarding 50, 100, 300 people? That is his, man, God has yeah. gifted him for that. Because yeah. he hasn't gifted me for that. I found <laughs> out. My congregation found out too. <laughs> that's but, why you know, you're a teacher now. Yeah, that's right. An evangelistic teacher. But you know what we do, guys, is that we look at the big slice of the, the, the big, all the ministry, the work of the church, and we take a little slice and we specialize in that. Right. So we can, we can get kind of myopic in our thinking. Well, I think we would all agree, that's why we're working together here, that, um, that we need to help the church. We need to equip Christians to be yeah. strong. The, the, the plumb line is way too low. Getting through youth group and staying in church is not what God calls us to do. Right. He calls us yeah. to be the head, not the tail. He calls us to influence. Mm -hmm. right. So we just need to equip Christians for real life in real ways. And, and how do we do that? By, by those questions that we heard in that last video clip, providing answers to that. And, and, and discipling people. How do you explain the gospel to someone? What are the major components of the gospel that need to be communicated right. to a world that believes in evolution? And, and what yes. are the main, you know, study the enemy. Study the way the enemy is attacking the right. gospel. I mean, we do Q&A times. I mean, people are amazed. They will start to ask me a question. I'll hit a button and, and I've got a PowerPoint explaining their question. They're not even done asking right. me the question. And they're kind of, you know, people are looking, is this a setup? Well, no, I hear the same mm -hmm. 20 questions. And the enemy's got nothing new. He's just, Why do you keep playing the same card? Yeah. yeah, so I think we, it's a combination. Years. I think I alluded to Paul in three worlds. I think we need to get rooted in scripture, stay studying God's word. The Bible says eternal life in John 17 says, starts by knowing God mm -hmm. and knowing Jesus. We need to be walking with him, knowing his voice, all right. those things. But we need to definitely be grounded in apologetics, yes. grounded in worldview training, all those things. And we need to understand it as, as citizens of whatever country you're part of, you need to know how to work within the boundaries that, uh, that we, yeah. we've been given. There. You know, the good news about, uh, about starting that process is the more you learn about Scripture, the more you learn about Christ and, and, and how we relate to Him, the more you want to learn. That's yeah. right. And it's, a, it, it, it's kind of a self-feeding process That's where, right. you, where you, you, God gives you a, a more of a desire to know Him if, if, if you're interested in, if you have a little bit of interest so to true. start off. And witnessing, guys, if you look at the book of Acts, Acts 1-8, I've given you power to witness. The whole thing, all this stuff we're talking about is in the framework of witnessing. Right. We've got to get people witnessing again. Yeah. Great. Corey, th thanks so much for coming on to the, uh, onto the program as no we problem. wrap up these 24 episodes. Yep. This has been a real fitting conclusion mm -hmm. to this study of uh, God's thanks creation. Thanks for inviting me. It's been great.